everybody again for coming out to Third Street Gallery. Got the same show today. Um, got Trisha's beautiful architectural photography. And it's called the Don't Paris, Paris Makakutsa. Don't worry about it. I've, I've been practicing. He's going to tell you exactly how to say that. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce Trisha. <laughs> Thanks, Clem. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Jim kindly sent me a file on how it's pronounced, and I've been practicing for a week, but I'll probably butcher it. So, right, this will be my blanket apology for anyone here who is Basque, or anyone watching who is Basque, because I will probably butcher the word. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, my interest has always been in structures, be they social or, or, in this case, architectural, and how people interact with them which is why on top of being just generally obsessed with Geary buildings, um, the, the uh, Bilbao uh, Guggenheim has become a real passion for me uh, because it has an interesting um, positioning in both Bilbao and Bilbao and positioning in the Basque world. Um, Bilbao is in the Basque country, it's in the north of Spain, um, it isn't the capital of the Basque country, it is, San Sebastian is, but um, Bilbao is an interesting city because it has changed over the years and with its change, the identity of the Basque people have also changed somewhat. The Basque people were originally agrarian shepherds and Bilbao was um, from the flood essentially a market town where they would come and sell their goods, you know, their agricultural fleece, lamb, goat products, kinds of thing. But in the 20th century, it became a major industrial site because the mines around the area had all the makings for steel. So it became a, a major steel producing city as well as a major shipping port. Well, as we all know, the 90s hit, the 80s and 90s hit, Rust Belt happened. And Bilbao, like many industrialized cities, began to decline. And the town fathers were like, what to do about this? We've got to reverse this somehow. And um, the idea came up with, about making it a more arts and technology city. And in fact, uh, where the Guggenheim sits was on the site of the major steel mill in the city. And um, when bids were first put out to architects to uh, look at that, you know, um, there were these two towers there, and the architects were trying to include that, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, for various reasons, that, that phase one sort of didn't work out. But on a referendum, the people said, we want a major museum there. The people of the city actually said this, that we want a museum there. So Guggenheim came in and they brought Geary along with them and said, well, how about a Guggenheim Museum? Now, talk about a mafia offer, how can you resist that one? <laughs> um, and so 25, this is the 25th anniversary year of the opening of the Bilbao Guggenheim. And it really has become um, the symbol of the city. And in fact, for the opening, Coons made this major puppy sculpture made of flowers that was like as tall as the building, just about, in front of the building. And it was supposed to be a very temporary, just kind of for the opening year and stuff. Well, the people fell in love with it and they said, no, please keep it. <laughs> Can we please have that forever? And that has become the reference to the building and also the mascot of the city. But to let you know how much this has changed the city, there is a major resurgence of art. There are art galleries all over the place. The government buildings all have art spaces in their ground floors. So there are galleries and there are pro-am watercolor societies, oil, oil paint societies, acrylic paint societies, photography societies. You name an artistic form, there's a society for it and they all show in these government spaces, these government building spaces, these galleries that the government has turned over. So it really has changed, and there's a resurgence in interest in Basque art. There have been many exhibitions on Basque art and things of that nature. So uh, it really has, again, changed the identity of the people, which I find fascinating. And then again, as I said, Geary 
his buildings are just, I'm obsessed with them. I was photographing another one in London this past summer, you know, and I'll probably drive Ken nuts saying, we're going to travel the world so I can photograph Gary buildings. <laughs> <laughs> but in order for something to really work, it can't just be splash, shiny, new, yay, this is who we are. It has to have a reference to the back. And that's what's so fascinating about this building. Of course, as you know, all of Geary's buildings are really sculptures, which I find beautiful. But these two photographs aren't for sale. They're here really as a reference. Um, so you can actually see the building. But the building is a deconstruction of a ship, hearkening back to the shipping days. Also, I mean, sadly, you can't see it very well, but there are when, uh, these two towers, as I said, existed, these two smokestacks existed on the site, and Gary's like, no, we're taking those now. But what he did, two, two towers up, but they were deconstructions of the original towers. So again, the reference back to what it was. So there's that connection, that, that continuity from the past to the current identities. Also, just so you know, um, this lovely red bridge is the Punt La Salva, and um, that is actually a sculpture by an artist, painted in a very particular manner, as instructed by the artist. It was a little controversial. They're like, oh, that big red bridge, or it's taken away from the building. But it actually, I think it actually works. But yet again, this idea of new identity, this reinvention, which brings me to the Basque word, which is the title of this. And let me see if I can get it. Veras Makucha which is the best word for reinvention. Because the city and the people have reinvented themselves. So that's just to give you some background on the building and why the building, for me at least, is so amazing. It's because of the way the people interact with it. The way the building has shaped the, ident the new identity of the people. And it really is an art and technology center. As I said, there are all of these art spaces that are absolutely amazing. So. In my past life, I was really interested in doing, in my research, doing deconstruction and critical discourse analysis, pulling things apart, trying to understand how, what it is that makes them what they are. And hence, that's really, so my interest in structures in general has taken me to architectural photography. My, in, my interest in deconstruction has brought me to abstract architectural photography. And that's pretty much what I tried to do here, was try and get at the spirit of the building. What makes this building the amazing place that it is? And uh, there are lots of things, and things that are very signature of Geary. But for this building, you'll see the cladding on the outside is titanium, which means the building changes colors during the course of the day. It goes from this very deep gold to at night it's actually silver, which is fascinating to watch. Now, I mean, yeah, I would really love to spend a month there photographing this. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and you see, um, because I did take this over the course of several hours on one day. Uh, as I said, I would love to take it over the course of several hours, several days. But we'll, hopefully someday that will happen. Um, but, um, oh, and saying about it's the ship, you can actually see, really see it in this. Because there's the bow, the stacks the smokestacks of the ship, you know, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but again, here, that green was actually on the building that day. It just reflected this green color back. And um, that blue sky is amazing because it's usually dolefully dark and cloudy in buildings. <laughs> so blue skies are very exciting. But another thing of uh, looking at the outside of the building, and I'll go to the internal shots, um, so many of his buildings have these, one of his signatures are these undulations. The buildings twist and turn and have all of these amazing places that are just fun. So, you know, like the sweeping thing of that, uh, which of course is supposed to be part of the ship, of course it almost looks like, you know, duck wing or something to me. Um, and um, sometimes photographs just surprise you. This one was a major surprise to me when I took it, the way it turned out, because it became, it's like, I think it's the most abstract one of the lot. Um, but I just love the way, um, the flatness of it, but then this looked imposed, and you can actually see the folds and crinkles in the building. 
when I first brought the pieces in and they're strewn out on the floor in the order in which they were going to go um, to get ready for hanging, a young man looks in the window and he's looking, he's looking, and I called him in and he says to me, is that the Geary building in Case Western? And I said, no, actually it's the Geary Guggenheim in Bilbao. And he says, oh, he says, because I was looking at this window. This is one of his signatures. Any one of his buildings have these shardy-like windows, which I think are just dramatic, exciting. Um, and, uh, and this one, just because of where it sits, reflects all sorts of colors. I happened to catch blues because of the sky and stuff that day. But it reflects all different kinds of colors. I've been there several hours you know, over several periods of time. Um, and what is also fascinating about the building, because as I said, when you look at it from the outside, it's this amazing piece of sculpture. When you go inside, it's like walking through the sculpture. And that's the other thing I found fascinating about it. So um, these are internal shots where I just looked up, you know, to um, through. Um, this is actually in the passageways and in the lobbies where you get to see this. Now, Claire isn't here today. Claire is one of our members and a fellow photographer. And Claire has the patience of a saint. She, will, she has beautiful pieces in the back. I recommend you look at them. But she will work on pieces for hours to perfect them. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I, I'm the lazy photographer. I'm actually more interested in the camera than I am the computer. I do as little adjustments as possible and absolutely no manipulations. I mean, the adjustments I'll do is, I'm excellent at clone stamping, so I'll get rid of anything that I think is distracting and noisy, and of course play with brightness and contrast, etc. But this piece drove me nuts, because when I printed it out, this was just a big black blob. <laughs> and, it, and while I won't normally work more than an hour on a piece, this was over two hours of work, just to get this, the texture and stuff of this piece of the structure correct. And when I thought I finally had it, and on the screen it looked right, I printed it out, and it was a big black blob. And I looked at Ken and I said, screw it, I'm going to go look for another piece <laughs> to put in the show. And I'm looking around and I'm playing with the piece and he comes and he says, no, come and look at it. As the ink dried, actually, you could, it, all of the stuff came out, which was pretty exciting. Um, this actually is, yeah, again, this is an internal, when you go into the lobby, there is just this sweeping piece of metal structure that's part of the structure of the building. And that's the other thing that amazes me is how the structure, stuff that is absolutely structural, is also part of the aesthetic, is part of the actual sculpture. And that, that was what um, made me really interested in that. And then to come down here in the main lobby, this is what you see when you look straight up. And actually, this piece here is that piece on the end. Um, but when you look up, this is what you get to see. And it's, as I said, it's just this amazing, ungulating, fascinating piece of sculpture. I've had several interesting comments on this. Uh, Jim actually was the one who said, I'm going to say nice things about you, Jim, <laughs> that it reminded him of like a Henry Moore sculpture in a lot of ways, uh, which I thought was interesting. And uh, someone else said, yeah, it looks like a nude a very abstract nude, but, which could be intentional on his part. I'd love to talk to him about it some year. Um, as I said, being obsessed must be able to get me an interview. <laughs> um, and then again, this is another one shot from inside and it, through in one of the passageways. The ceiling is, is, you know, the ceiling has these wonderful, huge windows with grids and stuff. The other thing that I find fascinating about this building is for those of you who have been to the Guggenheim in New York, Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim, I am thoroughly convinced that Frank Lloyd Wright hate, hates art and hated artists. <laughs> because it is the world's worst museum. Fascinating building, but the world's worst museum. Because you can't see the damn art. Because you're either standing like this trying to see it, and if you try and back up far enough, you go right out. <laughs> What amazed me about this building the first time I got to walk through it, um, to, to actually, I actually did go and look at exhibits, um, was when you go into the exhibition area, save one, the building goes away. It's big vanilla boxes 
of exhibition space. It becomes all about the art. The only space where that is slightly different is he made this fantastic, I mean, it looks like an airplane hangar. It's huge cavernous space with 75 foot ceilings. And that was for large scale installations. So right now there's these large scale kind of uh, mazy sculptures you can wander through and stuff which are pretty cool. And when you view them from above, they're really neat. And so there you can actually see the ceiling. But again, it's so far away from the art that it doesn't distract. So while as amazing as the building is, it doesn't distract from the art, which I love Frank for. I think that's very nice of him. Um, so anyway, but yeah. Um, so no, just to, if you look at this piece and you look at this piece, again, because I love this window, but this is actually this. This is, I just did a, a you know, amazing, a really close up of, obviously. But again, this was taken later in the day when the light was beginning to wane. And you can see it's starting to move to that silvery tone. Whereas here, it was the very dark gold. And I said, and that's one of the fascinating, wonderful things about this building, uh, besides being an amazing sculpture. And I think I've chuntered on enough, but it is Baramaskucha. Um, Baras Mascucha, sorry. And again, my apologies to anyone who is Basque. Uh, I will be happy to learn pronunciation. Um, but anyway, that is the show. Are there any questions? Yes? I'm very uh, curious about the soft, quilt-like appearance mm -hmm. of the photographs of strong metal. And given the history that you gave in terms of uh, the original population and so forth, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if I'm reading this into your photographs or, in fact, if it speaks out of the buildings of themselves that they seem to have a folk uh, patchwork quality to, to the actual application of the metal. That is interesting. Now, uh, I've been doing research on the building. I've not come across anything like that, but I'm going to keep digging. It could very well be. Or I, yeah, it could very well be that that's what's happening. It also, it could very well be, because actually when you walk up to it, it's actually very smooth. So it could just very much be the way the light is catching it. That's what I was yeah, wondering yeah, about. Yeah, it's, a lot of it is the way the light actually is reflecting off of it. And this is like right by the water, so you're also getting not only light coming down, but light off the water to reflect it. And what's really interesting is, OK, you can half see it here. There's a pool, and there's the famous spider, um, spider sculpture that's also kind of emblematic. Uh, and what's really interesting is they'll have steam come up out of the pool of water occasionally, which then also gives the building a fascinating effect. Yeah, so they actually really, really do play up the way this building is so changeable in various lights. So and in fact, I've been there on rainy days. And it looks almost mystical because it's shimmery and things like that. Yeah, I mean, so it really, a lot of it is just the way the light hits it during different parts of the day. I'm Please. Just curious what period of time these, paint, these photos were these taken? These photos were taken. Um, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> um, Mid-morning for the, uh, I started at mid-morning for the outdoor shots. This one was um, later when the sun was a bit higher. Um, the inside shots were probably around, uh, they, they were after lunchtime, the indoor shots. Uh, but the outdoor shots were pretty much mid-morning to uh, just after noon time. If I went back another, on another day at another time, it would be, Completely. As I said, I would love to do it, but I only had so much time to devote to it. Yeah, this um, here is this part of the building here, uh, just you know, so you can piece it together, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, and there's actually now what is called the Bilbao Guggenheim effect, where if you talk to urban planners, they talk about the Bilbao Guggenheim effect because this building really has transformed the city. It, as I said, it really has reinvented the entire city and the identity of the people there. 
Um, <laughs> there was a young man in here who's an urban planner. He says, well, of course you've heard of the Bill Bell Guggenheim. I said, oh, yeah, I've been reading a lot about that lately. And he says, you know, it doesn't work every place else. I said, I know, because unless you have the backing of the people who are willing, and even at that $300 million mark, there were certain things that were never that they couldn't finish that have been left unfinished. So, like, as I said, I didn't get any, I'm, in this round. I don't have pictures of the towers, but there's actually a staircase that goes up into one of the towers. Well, that was supposed to be a very elaborate staircase. It was so you could view the building from different aspects. They could only build the one main staircase. So it's like, well, at least we have something, <laughs> you know. But um, so even with running out of money, they made sure they could get the project done and the, the absolute essentials put in place. But yeah, but the people really wanted this. I mean, they really, this idea of you know, making it an arts place and as I said, making this the place that just, and this building has really solidified that and transformed, or as I said, has helped with the reinvention of the place, of, this, of the city and its people. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, Here. Is part of your technique to always look upward at all? feels like it's looking up yeah. straight on. Yeah, because I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, that's a lot of it. I'm kind of short, so I tend to be looking up at things anyway. But yeah, actually, I do like that looking up aspect. I have some internal shots from up on a deck, but even up on the deck, I didn't have really quite the rise that I would need if I was taller or could learn to walk on stilts, maybe. But And I don't like ladders. They're too rickety for me, so I don't go up them. But yeah, no, I really do tend to do a lot of that. And I really do believe it's because I'm, I'm down here and the world is up there. Yeah. But I also like that sort of soaring. Um, a, a lot of my other photographs, you see, have that almost recursion effect where you're looking through and it just seems to go on through and through. And I think that's what it is. I kind of like that recursion effect. The looking up also kind of gives me that effect. Yeah. Yeah, Brian. My uh, architecture expertise uh, comes from one tour I went on once, <laughs> where the tour guide said you always want to look at where the building meets the sky. Mm. And you that. Yeah. It's great. Thank you. It's Thank you. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. The sky really, you know, kind of helps it. It caps yeah. it, but also, yeah. yeah. That one looks like you're know, like just the right moment. Yeah. So yeah. Awesome. A lot of it is just. I mean, and I think that's the other thing I like about photography is that sometimes it's just dumb luck. Yeah. <laughs> You're just in the right place at the right time, you know. And uh, and several of these with the light is, yeah. So where you have a good eye. Sorry? Or you have a good eye. Or, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, but yeah. But but so much of it is just right place, right. Because as I said, and, and also never knowing what's going to come out sometimes. Because as I said, when this one popped out, when I pulled it up on the screen, I was completely surprised at it. That was like my, oh, wow, that's kind of cool. How did, that, how did I do that? But it was just right place, right time kind of thing. The light was just catching it in a particular way. You know, so I caught it, yeah. They look, some of them look like paintings. <laughs> thank you, yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming. And again, we don't